and everything turn, turn, turn. We could play that one too. <laughs> I want to thank Sal today for uh, hopping in in the place of the, uh, Mr. Kirkland. Joanne's not feeling well, I forgot, so keep her in prayer, too. She's a bit under the weather today. Christopher it is, right? Yes. Okay. Christopher Thomas, got to keep the two of you straight now. <laughs> we welcome Christopher here. Have everyone got to say hello to Christopher? Now, what I'm going to speak about today, I'm just going to open up my Bible and whatever verse I land on, I'm going to preach on. Amen. Oh, Lord, you misled me and I allowed myself to be misled. You are stronger than I am and you overpowered me. Wow. That's a powerful word out of Jeremiah 20. <laughs> Bertha will break you and make you and mold you. Let's see if we got the magic slides working here. The window of the soul. Jennifer said she's been waiting all week for this. So. All right, a second just passed. I have to wait another week. We're hanging on. That's all right. When you get there, it'll pop up because I have it on my phone too. Always prepared like a good Boy Scout I was. Oh, no, let's go to the, uh, we'll, we'll skip this for now. <laughs> Unless you guys want to do the trivia question. Does anybody want it? Well, it's up there now. Let's just do it real quick. Food for thought, okay? When was Jesus crucified? Wednesday, Thursday, or Friday? Wednesday. Thursday. Friday. Friday. Who, sa who says Wednesday? Raise your hand. Who says Thursday? Raise your hand. Who says Friday? Raise your hand. Come on, man. <laughs> what we think we know is not often what we actually know. We often believe things at face value without ever questioning them, especially in the church. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. If Jesus was crucified on Friday, could he have been in the, could he been in the belly of the earth three days? Because no. we know he resurrected on the Sabbath, right? Which was well, the day after the Sabbath, the first day of the week, which is Sunday. So, boom. The Jewish calendar works differently than ours. Since it was a feast week, there were two Sabbaths in the week of the Passion. Nisan 14 was a midweek, that's a Wednesday, was the Passover. Since the Passover is a rest, the feast is celebrated on Tuesday evening. Remember, 6 o'clock p.m. is the start of the new day for the Jews, not midnight. Jesus' trial went on Tuesday night into Wednesday morning. Remember the complaints about the trial at this hour? And there, some of the priests were complaining. And Jesus is crucified at 9 a.m. Remember, he has to die on the Passover. He dies at 3 p.m., which was the ninth hour. And he is placed in the tomb at dusk. So he's in the tomb Wednesday night, Thursday night, Friday night, and in the grave Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. He raises at dusk on Saturday, the start of the new day, and is discovered Sunday morning by the women coming to spice him. He is thus in the tomb three full days and three full nights fulfilling the prophecy. My point is, none of this matters really, right? Doesn't matter. Really doesn't. But our thinking does. We just accept these traditions as truth when they're not. Just food for thought, right? I always like to critically think, especially when it comes to spiritual things. Isn't that amazing? But Good Friday, he was in the tomb. Why is it called Good Friday? Because it's a tradition that the church made up to try to explain it, and it was it was an error. Tradition of men. Yeah, just like December twenty fifth is not the real Christmas time. Not even close. Yeah, that's tradition that the church made up. That's how they celebrate the Passover, but the Passover's not celebrated on Thursday. 
It's on Nisan 14, which has to be a Wednesday, which means you have to do your Passover Seder the night before because you're not allowed to work on a Sabbath. So Tuesday was the celebration of the Passover. Tuesday after dinner at 6 p.m., Jesus went to the Garden of Gethsemane, right? He was arrested somewhere around 2 a.m. in the morning, according to the time schedule. His trial was at 3 a.m. He, he was taken to Pontius Pilate at 6 a.m., scourged, brought back at 8 a.m., and crucified at 9 a.m. That's right. And remember, they were complaining, whoa, at this hour you want to do a trial? Really? It's a tradition made up by the church. It's a tradition of men. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not going to shame or condemn them, but it's just it's a tradition. So it really means nothing in the scheme of things. Yeah. Yeah. All right, let's go on to bigger and better things. Did you enjoy that? Bible trivia. I got a little message today called the Master Minister. An astounding, astounding revelations from the gospel accounts. There's, gonna, there's nothing fancy about this message other than it's some observations and how do we deal with them. Jesus was the ultimate architect of ministry. Amen? Amen. Jesus functioned in all the gifts of the Spirit. Amen? Amen? Jesus is the head of the church. Should we not take our cue from the example that he set before us on how to do ministry? The problem is we've incorporated traditions, just as I talked about, into what we think is ministry, but doesn't really reflect how Jesus ministered. And I'm going to show you some challenging stuff today, some conclusions. Throughout the history of the church age, much of the church have been stunted by the influence of personal narratives and interpretations of the gospel and ministry styles based on a variety of factors. Everybody has a personal narrative. That means we interpret our life through our narrative. It goes through our lens of how we see things. No matter what we're seeing, we reinterpret it and then change what we're seeing. Like universalism believes there's no hell. So now they interpret all of Christianity that there's no hell when they go into error. Amen? <clears throat> Some of these include denominationalism. We interpret everything through our denomination, the 16 pillars of assemblies. Pop psychology, Religion, which is human effort, human reasoning, traditions, and a myriad of other things. The problem with personal narratives is that they reinterpret everything through the lens of that unbalanced or wrong belief. Wrong thinking equals wrong believing. I can say Jesus is Lord and Jesus is, the, is God in the flesh, which is clearly in the Bible, and a Jehovah Witness will say, no, he's not. And it's written right there, he is, all over the place. What we think we know. Much of the religious community was guilty of the same thing in Jesus' day as today, as it is a part of the fallen human nature. When we think we know what we really don't know is a recipe for missing God. The way to truly know God and walk in the truth requires us to simply be wearing the right interpretive lenses of our personal narrative. There is the right pair of glasses to wear. The finished work of the cross teaches us to see through the eyes of grace and love. We then are able to overcome the world and the flesh by interpreting the word of God and the things we encounter in ministry through the eyes of grace and love. The Holy Spirit then truly reveals the heart of the Father in all situations. We only need to look to the head of the church as an example and a lead on what real ministry looks like. Let's take a little journey here today. Leaven is our false narratives. I use it as an example. It ruins the bread, the pure gospel. A little leaven works through the whole lump and ruins it. Amen? In order to properly minister, we first must abandon our presuppositions, narratives, and what we think God should do or say in a situation and truly walk in the Spirit humbly, interpreting and processing everything through the lens of grace and love, which is the finished work of the cross. The effect of this was clear. Jesus' ministry style came into conflict with the religious system and traditions of men. Amen? 
Here are some quick important points, and then we'll go into a few stories. Number one, Jesus was in tune with the Father. It's the best word I can come up with. It's they flowed together. Maybe you guys can come up with a better word, but you get the point. John 5, 19. Truly, truly, I tell you, the Son can do nothing by himself. Listen to this. Unless he sees the Father doing it. For whatever the Father does, the Son also does. See how they're in tune? I can do nothing by myself. I judge only as I hear. My judgment is just because I do not seek my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Are we to judge? Absolutely to judge. Jesus had to judge things according to what seeing through the Father. We understand what this is real judgment, not the bad judgment, which is hypocrisy, which is pointing out everybody's bad faults and making yourself look good. That's judgmentalism. There's a difference between judgmentalism and proper spiritual judgment. See right here? I judge as I hear. So Jesus would see a situation, he would interpret it through the Father's eyes, and judge that situation accordingly. Jesus walked so closely with the Father that he was completely in tune with Daddy. So much so, it was natural for him to see and interpret every situation through the narrative of the Father's heart. Jesus ministered out of union. John 14, 9. Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is what? In me. Yep. The words I say to you, I do not speak on my own. Instead, it is the Father dwelling, in me. carrying out his work. So where is Jesus when he ministers? In, in the Father. Where are we when we minister? In the Father. If you're in Christ, you're in the Father. If you're in Christ, you're in the Spirit. You live out of that place. Big one right here. His identity was completely and totally in union with the Father and the Father's heart. There was no Jesus, it was Jesus plus Daddy, right? So much so that he was spiritually indistinguishable from Daddy. Because Jesus lived and ministered only through the perspective of union. In fact, when Jesus ministered, he manifested physically the Father, a foreshadowing of the church's future role. Let that sink in. Sorry we don't have the slips, but um, Clint was gone. He's got the printer at his house. So if you got anything to write down, you'll have to go to the YouTube channel, gracegathering.com. Shameless plug. <laughs> Show your friends and neighbors the good news, not for our sakes, but for the sake of the gospel. Jesus ministered grace and love to the lost. Jesus expertly, and I use this word expertly, he never wavered in this. It was never somewhat or kind of expertly ministered grace and love, the heart and intention of the Father towards man. That's the ultimate expression of the Father to lost sinners to the point that love overwhelmed their struggle and made it almost invisible. The person was able to see their value and were awakened to the fact God was madly in love with them. This often caused effortless and instantaneous change and transformation. I'm going to show you astounding stuff. Because they were persuaded in their hearts by the revelation of the Father's heart and desire for them, which was madly, unconditionally in love. God didn't care about the sin. The sin didn't matter. He came to destroy that which killed what he desired. You and I. There's nothing in this universe that can compare to a single human being in the eyes of Daddy. Now apply that to the situations going on in your life. It's hard, but it's truth. I struggle with it too. Now here's the, on the flip side, Jesus ministered tough love to the religious. The only people he was tough with was the people who thought they had it all together. Jesus still loved the religious people. 
Right? Amen? He loved them as much as he did the sinners. Right? However, because the religious could only see through their presupposition, mainly their self-righteous efforts and traditions, their personal narratives, they were unable to see their true spiritual condition and the need for Christ. Therefore, Jesus was left with the only option he had to show them their true condition outside of grace in order to awaken in them the truth. Law for law, he went with them. Because the law kills. They had to die. So if you didn't get it, you couldn't receive the grace message that he wanted to give you. You were boxed it out by your religious self-efforts. You only had one option left. Tip over the tables. Amen? Let's see some examples. Exhibit number one. Now, obviously, we can't read through all these stories, but these are all the basic stories in the gospel. And I encourage you, I madly encourage you to write down these scriptures and go read them and see what I'm seeing. Amen? So this one happens in Luke chapter 5, verses 17 through 26. Here are some observations of the story. Everybody know the paralyzed man... Jesus was ministering in this house, and it was packed, and they couldn't fit this guy in. So his friends ripped the roof open and lowered him down. Right? Now here's some interesting perspectives of it. Here's what we've got to come to grips with. There was no evidence the man asked for or believed in his healing. He didn't ask for it. doesn't say he asked for it. The faith of his friends is what stirred Jesus' heart. Because Jesus hears heart language, right? He hears it. He could be in this crowd right now and Jesus will hear the hearts of you. He's not going to worry about your external circumstances, but he will hear your heart. And when you have a faith <clears throat> is what awakens him and gets his radar going, right? When he sees faith like that, Jesus was always, do, 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 do. send the heat-seeking missile, there it is, faith. That person right in the back there. And he goes and ministers to them and ignores the rest of the people. So in this situation, Jesus stopped what he was doing. He stopped right in the middle of his message. Here comes this guy down in the basket. Right? And you know the, the religious people are sitting there watching because they spied on him everywhere he went. The man never asked for his sins to be forgiven, nor did he give a repentance message. Jesus simply forgave his sins. It was unconditional forgiveness. Again, the only evidence of faith was based on his friends. Right? Now, this does, not, this does not mean, so don't take this the wrong way, that, you know, this universal salvation garbage, because that's nonsense. But what happened was this heart language was awakened, and he never, he never came to the altar, did he? Oh, Lord, forgive me of all my sins, for I am, a, I am a terrible sinner. Never said that, did he? Jesus walked over him and proclaimed his innocence. And he was physically healed. Right? Who got angry? The religious people. The religious people got angry. Why? It, because it's against their paradigm. Oh, you got to repent. You got to go make a sacrifice. You can't just declare someone innocent. Jesus came to declare the innocence of man. That is the heart of the Father. Amen? Since this was an obvious challenge to the typical religious system and doctrines, Jesus then physically healed him to prove his supernatural divinity and authority. And the religious people walked away angry. Exhibit number two, the woman at the well in John chapter four. This is a powerful story. You all know the story, right? So we don't have 25 minutes to read it. <clears throat> Some of the observations from the woman at the well. Go home and read this and, and match it with what I'm saying. See for yourself. You'll probably even have more observations. I'm not the all in all. This is a classic setup by Jesus. You'll notice the unique way he evangelizes in this situation. Now you are a sinner and you need me. You need the gospel. I want you to come up to the altar call. And I want you to pray with me. Dear Jesus, I am a sinner. I am a sinner. And I repent. 
and please be the Lord of my life. Didn't do that, did he? She was of another race. She was not Jewish. This is a prophetic fulfillment of the Gentiles. He went deliberately. He knew this woman was going to be at the well. He went deliberately to minister to this woman because he heard the Father. Remember, we talked about the union. He used spirit talk to speak to her spirit, coupled by a word of knowledge and then a declaration of who he was. Sir, I perceive you are a prophet. He read her her mail without condemning her. You know, you, yeah, you're right in saying that the man you're sleeping with right now is not your husband. In fact, the past five haven't. I perceive you are a prophet. <laughs> Notice he did it in a way she didn't feel condemned. He says, yeah, I know. I know what you've done. No big deal. That's, that's the message she was getting. He confronted her sin with grace to the point that she was virtually unaware. It was a painless surgery. She didn't feel all condemned. She's just like, wow, she had a revelation. I'm the Son of God, he said. Here I am. Wow. And the woman left her jar, that was her burden, at the well and ran to tell the rest of the town about the encounter. And the town got saved. There was no altar call, confessions, repentances. They simply believed. Jesus expertly evangelized without condemnation. He didn't give a sin message or demand a sinner's prayer in this situation, did he? Simply a word of knowledge given through grace, declaring who he was. The woman did the evangelizing. She just simply declared what she saw and what happened to her. And here comes Jesus. They're like, wow, he really is the Son of God. And a Gentile town got fully saved. We're going to take this city for Christ. The only one that did it was Him. Amen? Let's go to Exhibit 3. The curious case of Zacchaeus. This will blow your theology right out of the water. Luke 19, 1-10 is where it is. You all know this story. Jesus is coming into town. Everybody's all excited because they hear what he's done. Right? And little old Zacchaeus, he's the tax collector and he's a cheat. He's dirty. A dirty politician is what he is. And so the people hate Zacchaeus, right? But he's heard about this Jesus. See, the people have too. That's why they're running out to see him because word traveled quick. So Zacchaeus says, I've got to see this for myself. I want to catch a glimpse if this guy is really the Messiah. And he climbs up because he's a little guy. It says he's short in stature. So he climbs up the tree. And here comes Jesus' radar. Mm, 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 mm. I hear faith. Ooh. Jesus saw there was four or five hundred people there probably. But Jesus' radar picked up who? He picked up Zacchaeus up on the tree. Ignored the rest of the crowd. Walked right through him. Says, hey, little man, we're coming to eat at your place tonight. He invited himself. Tom, we're coming over later. Uh -oh. <laughs> Nancy's vacuum's going to get rolling. <laughs> Zacchaeus, you know, he was the cheat, and the crowd, it says, got upset. Oh, it says the crowd, they grumbled amongst themselves. Oh, does he know who this guy is? You see, the crowd wanted justice. The crowd would have loved it if he would have called down fire from heaven. They would have been cheering away, and he burned up Zacchaeus' house. Now, that's not what Jesus did, did he? His simple act of inclusion, which was a display of grace and love, effortlessly and naturally caused repentance in Zacchaeus' heart without a single rebuke or mention of his sin. He didn't say a word to him. Dinner started and Zacchaeus gets up in a revelation from the Holy Ghost and says, wow, I'm a dirty cheat and I'm going to pay back everybody I did wrong threefold. And what did Jesus say to him? Salvation has come to this house today, right? Jesus' haunting closing statement, verses 9-10, through 10, make it clear he zooms right past the religious heart to where he sees the Father's working. 
He didn't care what the crowd was upset. The crowd wasn't ready to hear the real message. They saw all the loaves and fishes and the healings and all that. That's what they were there for. They weren't, they weren't there because they wanted to hear a message of the Father's acceptance. Let's be honest. Let, let, how, many, how many times in Christianity does someone with a gift of healing put on a big show and everybody runs to it? I'm driving to Dallas, Texas because the faith healer is there. What are they there for? Money. <laughs> well, yeah, that's some of it. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, they're, they're running to the latest thing. Oh, God's over there. God's not here. He's over in Dallas. I got to go get my healing. He's right in you, right? Now, I'm not against conferences and all that stuff, obviously, but we do that, don't we? The same thing. They showed up for the show. Oh, you hear about the loaves and fishes? I heard he gives out free meals. <laughs> it was good, too. Salmon. Exhibit 4, the woman caught in adultery. Observations from this fun one. This is another obvious setup except by the religious. They really thought they had Jesus on this one. They got together. We're waiting for the perfect opportunity. Oh, someone can, you got to see so-and-so. She's caught sleeping with so-and-so. They didn't take the guy, did they? They ran, they grabbed the woman. This is perfect, they said. You could just see it in the story. Maybe we should do a skit on that one. <laughs> We've got him now. We're going to end that grace message, aren't we? He has to obey the law. They really thought they had him. And you would think they would, don't you? They wanted to contain grace by limiting it with the law because that's what ticked them off. They burned with anger that Jesus was unconditionally declaring people's innocence outside of their religious paradigm. So grace superseded the law in a stunning fashion in this story. The very trap the religious laid for Jesus became their own noose. Jesus, in expert form, went law for law with the religious mind, skillfully using 2 Corinthians 3.7, the ministry of death, in its proper role to show the need for Christ. That's in the book of Galatians, right? The schoolmaster. 2 Corinthians 3, 7, the ministry of death, showing us our need for Christ, written in stone. So Jesus was like, all right, you want to go law for law? I'm the only perfect one here that can declare yes or no. He's the only one allowed to throw the stone in the whole crowd, was Jesus. But they didn't have a leg to stand on when he came at them with that, did they? You who are without sin, can cast the first stone. Got a little quiet in there, didn't it? And all I heard is the sound of rocks falling to the floor. And within a minute, the place cleared out. And who was the only one ready to receive the ministry right there? That whole crowd could have learned something that day, but they didn't want to hear it. They walked away in condemnation. Still didn't get it and missed the lesson. And there she was. Sister, anybody condemning you? She looks up. Nope. Then he says, neither do I. Go and sin no more. What gave her the power to go and sin no more? It was an unconditional display of grace that superseded the law now showed her her value and the power of sin was broken in her life right there. Not by anything she did. What he did. I think the church could use some lessons here. The harlot who washed Jesus' feet in Luke 7, 36-50. Here's some observations on that one. You all know this story. The Pharisee's mind is stuck in interpreting people through the lens of the knowledge of good and evil. Well, if he was really the Son of God, he would know the woman that's washing his feet right now. She's a whore. And the knowledge of good and evil. 
the law. She's a whore. Their lens of interpreting was through the law. And the law brings condemnation. There's no life in the law. It's a killer because that's its design to kill. And so they saw the woman as a harlot. Jesus' radar is kicking in. <laughs> Here it is. He's a heat-seeking missile of love right at her. See, Jesus could only see the Father's perspective of the woman's heart and use the simple parable to bring about the perspective, right? If you love a, forgiven a lot, you'll love a lot more. There's the lesson. And the woman had a pure revelation of grace as the embodiment of Christ. So she took the anointing oil, the perfume, and her tears, she's weeping, took her hair, washing Jesus' feet, the most dirty part of your body, right? That was a symbol. She was saying something to everybody. You can't humble yourself more than that. She didn't say a word. Not a word. Her actions is what spoke to Christ. And he looked down to her and he says, Woman, your sins are forgiven. Unconditional forgiveness without her saying a word. Her display of love returned unto Jesus because he spoke the heart language of God. She was in tune despite being a harlot. She understood the voice. She didn't have the religious paradigm because she knew she was lost. She had nothing to give. She had nothing she could do. She was hopeless and helpless and laid at the Savior's feet, knowing her condition. But it didn't hold her from coming and touch his feet because an unclean woman like that could not be in the presence of fellowship without first having to go to the sacrifice. She'd have to go to the temple to be cleansed. She broke the law by coming and touching him. She's unclean. Jesus didn't see it that way, did he? She had a revelation. Amen? Once again, the self-righteous were indignant. They were spiritually blind, not comprehending the kingdom of God, a display of the kingdom of God that was going on right before them. The prodigal, the prodigal son, Luke 15. Some quick observations because we've done this before. The father gave him his half of the inheritance knowing it was selfish and unwise. He never tried to stop him, did he? father knew what was going on there. The son was running off. He wasn't ready to handle that. You don't think the father didn't know that? Of course he knew that. Without question, he gave him his inheritance. But the father never stopped loving and longing for him, did he? Nor did the father disown him at any point. The father only saw and longed for the relationship with his son. When the prodigal son came to his senses, the father was overjoyed to him and blessed with an blessed. undeserved reception. He showed grace. The father blew right past his pre-prepared repentance speech and went to the feast. If only my father would accept me as a slave, I'll apologize. He goes to say, Father, I have sinned, but oh, prepare his feast. My son was dead, but he, now he's alive. Amen? Who got angry? He had, a, he had a problem with both of his sons, didn't he? Licentiousness versus law. Two were at the opposite ends of the spectrum. The younger son was licentious. He went into the world of sin, thought he could sin. I'm going to go live in sin. I don't care. Then you had Mr. Law, the older brother who defined his relationship with Daddy through his work and behavior. Dad, I worked hard and did everything you said. Why are you giving him a party for? Amazing, isn't it? His brother was infuriated at the superabundant outpouring of grace. Undeserved, unmerited favor that was shown to the younger brother who was a quote-unquote sinner. Amen? And lastly, the calling of Simon Peter, Luke 5, verses 1 through 11. Some observations. 
After a fruitless fishing expedition, Jesus challenged Simon Peter to go back out and fish again according to his instructions. This was a faith test. Jesus will give you a faith test. Hate to say it, but he does. He likes to give you an opportunity to show off him. That's why he does it. Not because he wants to beat you down, how you failed. He wants to give you an opportunity to rise up and he can show off through you. Simon got a revelation of Christ based on the supernatural test. He was a simple fisherman with no education. But that brother understood, I've been out here all day. When he told me to go put the net, the boat almost tipped over. That brother got an anointing. <laughs> Simon immediately came to the awareness of his true condition, and he actually feared Jesus. Go away from me, I'm a sinful man. Okay, Simon, you can work, uh, get your Master's of Divinity. Time to start. I'm going to send you to seminary. You got to call a ministry on your life. Time to get serious now. He didn't say that, did he? Put down your nets and I'll make you a fishers of men. Come with me. Bam, he's in ministry. You're in ministry. We're all in ministry. Doesn't matter if you're not a pastor or teacher or whatever. You're in ministry. You all have each un unique and individual gifts. Jesus welcomed him into the ministry instead. He went right past the sinner thing, didn't he? Jesus never even addressed it. Because Simon passed the test. He did what Jesus said and understood his true spiritual condition. Jesus chose simple, average people to become the foundations of the church. See 1 Corinthians 1, 25 through 31. I'll just read a few little portion of it, just as an encouragement. Powerful stuff, isn't it? The foolish plan of God is wiser than the wisest of human plans, and God's weakness is stronger than the greatest of human strength. Remember, dear brothers and sisters, that few of you were wise in the world's eyes or powerful or wealthy when God called you. Instead, God chose the things the world considers foolish in order to shame those who think they are wise. And he chose that which are powerless to shame those who think they are powerful and strong. God chose the things despised by the world, things counted as nothing at all, and used them to bring to nothing what the world considers important. As a result, no one can ever boast in the presence of God. He loves taking the weak and foolish things. How many of us all screwed up in our lives, right? How many of us have had made some big, big mistakes? Yeah. Guess what? You're qualified now. Because <laughs> he uses those things to bring glory to himself. He doesn't use the guy with the uh, $100 million BMW that really uh, made Apple computers, right? That's not impressive to God at all. Now, he made help him make a company because he wants them to be generous maybe or something. But what impresses him is our simple dependence on God. And sister, you could be in a wheelchair and have more, more anointing flowing through you than people who think they got it all together. In fact, you may be the very one to reach people that others can't. The same goes with all of us. We're not qualified based on what we do or who we are. We're, we're qualified based on Him and us. Amen. Amen. Amen? The lesson, it would be wise to base our ministry style after the pattern of Christ. After all, if the head of the church ministered this way while he was here, shouldn't we? It is time for an inward re-evaluation. Our narratives must not bend to the gospel. The gospel must bend our narratives. The way we view the world. The way we do, do ministry should bend to the will of God. You ever get some of those things where you see these people, I got this word of the Lord. The Lord spoke to me. Whenever I hear that, I get real scared. <laughs> 
I got a word from the Lord. The Lord spoke to me. Thus saith the Lord, a great earthquake is going to happen in America to teach you guys a lesson. I had someone write me that back in 08. By 2012, there's going to be a crack up here in Ohio. They literally said this. And God's going to be, the wrath of God is going to be poured out on America. What I'm hearing is what you think God should do. You're doing nothing but the same thing the disciples did to Jesus to the Samaritan town. Shall we call down fire from heaven and consume them for not believing? Jesus said the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but that they may be saved through him. If the head of the church takes that stand, should it not be our priority to align up with the head of the church and take his example when he ministered on earth. Amen? Amen? And there's a time and place to confront sin. Believe me, the Apostle Paul showed us that. But Apostle Paul ministered first. This is who you are. He begged him. This is who you are. This is the message I preach to you. You are included in Christ. You're a new creation. You're in him. You have every spiritual blessing in Christ. You're seated with Christ in heavenly realms. You're clothed with Christ. And he's, Paul's exhorting us, meditate upon these things. What is, uh, where is that scripture, sweetie? What is good? What is lovely? Yep. Philippians. Yep. That's the things that we're to meditate upon. That is supposed to be who we are. And when we're not, the Holy Spirit will ring the bell. ding a ling a ling a ling a ling Guys, this is really you. You're going the wrong way. That's how he ministers to us as believers. He doesn't slap us down. He doesn't condemn us through the law. He reminds you of who you are in him, that you are the righteousness of God in Christ. You know how long it took me to believe that? And I went to Bible school a long time ago. Never believed that was the righteousness of God in Christ. Only sometimes. I had to earn the rest of it. And then the Lord said, see you in 10 years. See how it works out for you. I'll go ahead and do that. When you get tired, let me know. And one day I got tired. I said, hey, Lord, I can't do There's something wrong. I give up. This is very good. Now I can talk to you. And I got good news. The thing that you're struggling against doesn't exist anymore. Now learn who I really am. I think we've all been there, right? Amen? Good stuff, isn't it? Yes. Challenging compared to the traditional way we do ministry in churches. Get our altar call ready. <laughs> Larry, get the mats out. We're going to pray for people. He went forward to receive Christ. He, we really know he's saved now. He went forward. He got baptized. It's the way it is. We know the truth, don't we? Who wants to pray for us? I've done enough praying today. Jennifer wants to pray. Oh, no, no, no. no oh, yeah, absolutely. Father God, thank you so much. Thank you so much for clarity. Please help us to follow your example. Father, please help us to follow your example. I want to remember that we're just like them without you. Thank you for your grace. In your name we pray. Amen. We're going to have communion real quick as we close.